well, infectious disease has evolved obviously greatly in Singapore, but in general, in, in my professional life, infectious disease has evolved quite dramatically. Um, I was trained by probably the late first or early second generation infectious disease clinicians, many of whom started off in uh, non, uh, either non-clinical or non-infectious disease uh, careers initially as either internists who had an interest in infections or as scientists who had an interest in microbiology. And that's where the field evolved from, from uh, those types of people. It's evolved dramatically in, in, in my professional lifetime uh, to the point where when I moved to Singapore, we were clinicians trying to take care of uh, newly um, new paradigms for managing patients with infections, the increasing number of immunocompromised patients in Singapore, to now where there are many infectious disease physicians in Singapore and, and many subspecialized, whether it's travel medicine, or orthopedic infections or transplant associated infections. Um, so it's evolved dramatically and uh, it's been a great honor and privilege for me professionally to be able to, to participate in the early years and to continue to participate uh, up to the current time. Yes. So that's the evolution is with regard to uh, what it takes to be an infectious disease physician. Um, I think there are certain characteristics that all of us have I, I, uh, as infectious disease physicians. I, I think we all have a good fund of knowledge of general medicine uh, and uh, a, a very good working knowledge of, uh, of the subspecialties of internal medicine. Um, I think uh, our, our grasp needs to be uh, quite thorough and quite, quite comprehensive of, uh, of general medicine and, 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 and above average for uh, many of the subspecialties. Um, I think uh, we need to have good problem-solving skills. Um, uh, that's obvious. And we need to be curious. Um, we need to be perseverant. Uh, we need to have a high threshold for tolerance. Um, attentive, observant, uh, need to be skilled communicators, diplomats, uh, debaters on occasion when, when tried to sway our, our clinical colleagues to maybe take a course of action that may not be the most uh, uh, apparent to them. And the final two things, I think we need to be organized and, um, and have an interest in teaching. All of those things make us lifelong learners. Uh, make us uh, hopefully interesting people. But it was uh, it was a extraordinary experience. I was a uh, young academic faculty member at Cornell, and uh, I understood the culture of where I was. I, I don't mean being in America. I mean the culture of the hospital, uh, and 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 I knew it well, and I was fluent. I knew how to. I have to say manipulate, but I knew how to get things to work. So coming to Singapore was uh, being dropped in a completely different environment uh, where I spoke certainly a language of communication, but concepts were, were not always uh, understood, uh, going both ways. So it was an extraordinary, exciting time for me. I, I love the notion of finding myself in the middle of uh, a new city, uh, a, a new place, and, and using my wits to find my way about. So that, that was an exciting experience. I, I will tell you I was, I, I, I was so, um, I was so thrilled that so many people were happy that I was there. It made me feel welcome and it made me feel like I knew a lot of people even before I actually knew a lot of people. Um, there had been a recognition by some of the clinicians that there was need for expertise beyond what was available in all the hospitals um, because of the immunocompromised host particularly and because of maybe some dissatisfaction with some of the outcomes. So they were, they were my, my guardians and helped me uh, get along. So there was overwhelming encouragement and support. There was a small pocket of folks who were unsure of what 
goal was that I was there to disrupt things or or maybe to um, not sure what the agenda was uh, not sure how me being there or infectious disease evolving as a subspecialty would rearrange and establish pecking order there was some issues with I came to be a, a, a evangelical for infectious disease and there were those who wanted me to do internal medicine to, to be no different than anyone else which was fine but that was maybe not the most efficient use of my time so there were some interesting discussions that went on there um, there was also some conceptual confusion at the time the thought was general medicine deals with infection sexually transmitted disease is dealt with at the skin center tuberculosis is dealt with on Woolman Road uh, or at the TB center um, communicable diseases are, 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 are uh, dealt with over at CDC there was no need what, what could I possibly be adding to this so that was part of the education but I will tell you it went extremely quickly uh, being uh, single-minded and having some really good uh, registrars working with me uh, we were able to go out and cross the lies and, and really uh, I think quickly convince people gee we have a value-added service but not just clinicians but uh, but uh, uh, administrators as well leaders yes. Right. Yeah. yes absolutely I can remember a very distinguished uh, uh, professor telling me what do you do? We do all of that. Well, the reality was you weren't doing it very well. <laughs> this we're doing it, but it wasn't. It wasn't uh, particularly uh, by the book. <laughs> um, well, it, it was. It was an interesting thing, as mentioned. Uh, it, you know, the Skin Center, the uh, CDC, uh, the TB uh, uh, Center, all uh, provided the expertise on the general ward, surgical or medical wards. Uh, you know, questions were often answered by the pathologist slash microbiologist. Uh, they provided the, uh, where are you moving? So, uh, some of the, the, the things that I, we observed, or I observed right off the bat was, I remember uh, the tips of endotracheal tubes and the tips of Foley catheters were often, indwelling bladder catheters, were often, well, not often, were almost always cultured. Routinely, the, the microbiologist would, had gotten tired of saying don't send them, and they just accepted all of these things. So there was, a, they were awash with these things, which no one could tell me why we were doing that other than that's what we've always done. So that was some interesting practices. It was, from an infection control perspective, it was, as you might imagine, it was a very interesting time. The hospitals had been, most of the hospitals I worked in, which were all the hospitals, had been designed decades before. And and accommodations for infection control really didn't exist. So it was, it was a real problem. Now, when the new um, uh, you know, National University Hospital came on in 86, which just a few years before I came, there was beginning to be um, some accommodation for that. But uh, it really wasn't until many of the hospitals were rebuilt, restructured, that uh, significant changes in infection control occurred. We're going to talk about that a little later. But well, I, I remember one of the things that I saw maybe my first or second day. I know my first day I went to the orthopedic ward and saw the little trolley with the hand washing thing using the same towel. So I, that was caught my eye. The second day I went into the intensive care unit and there was a, I'm sure I've told you this story, there was a basin of some sort of green solution that uh, endotracheal tube suction catheters would be dropped in and then pulled out of and then used again. And uh, they, one of the questions was, we don't understand why we have acinetobacter in every uh, patient's endotracheal aspirin or EPT e e tube culture, the hip culture. Like, well, I'm going to, I don't know right now, but I'm going to solve this, <laughs> where that might be coming from. So it was, uh, it was interesting. Yeah. Um, so the, the physical layouts of the hospital were a little bit uh, uh, diff difficult as far as from an infection control. Um, yeah. I think the thing that got 
infectious disease sort of uh, really in integrated into Singapore medical scene was the fact that we were beginning to do transplants. Patrick Tan had opened the bone marrow transplant unit over at SGH. Um, Ping Pao Shi and colleagues were dealing with a lot of autoimmune uh, patients with autoimmune disorders that they were immunocompromising and having issues with that. Um, HIV obviously had reared its head. So I think there was a recognition that there may be maybe some information and approaches out there that would be helpful. And that's, we took advantage of that. We, we were knowledgeable about that. The, the fellow, I mean, the registrar at nine, we were, we were able to quickly come to the aid and, and quickly ingratiate ourselves with uh, with our colleague. But the, 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 the infectious, I mean, the, the common infections, that was your second part of that question, were, were, uh, were really quite, quite, quite challenged. There was acinetobacter. I remember it, I used, I had uh, needed uh, multi-drug resistant acinetobacter in the burn unit. I had to get colistin. That was the only thing that was left. And colistin had not been used in decades. And I got it out of Germany. I got the last 50 vials. They said there's no more. Uh, so acinetobacter was a huge problem. Um, MRSA had already been a problem. It, it was unclear how long it had been a problem. Um, HIV was you know, was becoming a problem, not just from the medical management side of things, but uh, some of the other aspects of managing HIV. Um, you know, we saw more meliodosis than we see now, um, in which was extraordinarily fascinating to me from an immunologic perspective and from a post-pathogen uh, interaction. Uh, we saw, you know, I went, to Al I went to all the hospitals, so I went to Alexandria and see tropical pulmonary eosinophilia, which I'd never seen before in the Army Boys. Um, we had episodic cholera, and, you know, malaria and drumbeat of uh, typhoid. Uh, but bread and butter was nosocomial pneumonias, post-op wound infections, osteomyelitis, neutropenic fever, PWO, diabetic foot infections, that sort of thing. I took some notes. I went to an executive meeting uh, at one of the hospitals, and I had been a little frustrated by uh, uh, some of the things we had seen. You know, there, there was a real lack of recognition, a lack of valid data, a lack of uh, commitment, a lack of resources. Um, I think that the, the change came as a lot of money was being invested and a lot of resources, people and equipment were being invested in bone marrow transplants and heart transplants and liver transplants that was there when the first of those were done. And um, we'd been doing renal transplants for 15 years by the time I got to Singapore, but um, they were starting to see nosocomial or infections, uh, immunocompromised patient infections and, and, uh, and nosocomial infections, and I think that was a milestone because the people involved recognized that uh, outcomes could be improved. And, and they felt there's got to be something else. And they felt they were doing everything they could do from a technical perspective, which they were. And they said, okay, this is where the problem is. And so that's where we had the opportunity to make, it, make a difference. And for them to say, yes, okay, we will get you infection control nurses. We will gather data. We will, we will you know, use uh, international standards. We will, we will grade ourselves compared to others. That's, then it began on its own. And we still had the infrastructure problem. We still had the problem with, the physical plants. I remember the first, you may remember the first bone marrow transplant unit at SGH. Did you ever see that? I forget which. It was in the wing closest to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, oh, the old, the administrative building across the street. Anyway, it was a four bedded room, but all the transplant patients went in the same room. So if one of them got a respiratory infection, they all got it. It was, it was just that those were the limitations we dealt with. So I think that was the big thing. And then we had, there, there were a lot of uh, a lot of advocates and a lot of people doing work. Uh, nothing to do with me. I have no credit in this. These things, you know, Mavis Yo, Jimmy Sun, um, uh, uh, Feng Pao Shi was, was pushing forward. Um, you know, Helen was 
was very Helen O was very involved. It was uh, I think my son was involved in infection control and yeah. oh, Lin Moy Lin, Molly Wee, Lily uh, Lily Lang, Raymond Lin, Helen T T L Yi, and uh, uh, Doctor uh, uh, Kumura Singh. Kumura Singh. Yeah, they were they were all involved early on, and and I was I served on committees, but they were really moving things along infection control. Or, it was, it was, we adapted, we, we, we spoke up, we stated the obvious, we, I don't think got, there wasn't any emotional tantrums or anything, it was just persistent. I think folks like Mavis just sort of kept after it, were persistent, and we'd all independently go to meetings and restate the points, and after a while, everyone said, yeah, it sounds like it's worth it that we invest in this stuff. Because it sounds like we're spending more if we don't. I don't know that Texas is all that different than Singapore, to be honest with you. Uh, having lived in both places and worked in both places and understood the bureaucracy and the administration and the, the hurdles uh, the clinicians face. So I really don't think it's any different. I think pandemic influenza is always going to be an issue. I mean, we... Dallas is no different than Singapore. We don't have quite the volume, but we have a high volume of international travelers. We have a very cosmopolitan city here. And, uh, I mean, I see malaria. We obviously saw Ebola, uh, not just down the street from my hospital. Um, and so I think uh, the big issues are going to be, in, in, whether we're in Singapore or in Texas, we're going to be multi-drug resistant organisms um, because we have more... We, in, we treat patients more intensively now. We're able to keep people in the past, uh, alive when the past would not have survived, and as a consequence, they get these organisms. We have an aging population both in Singapore and Texas, so we're going to have more uh, folks that are being cared for in, in common areas, I suspect. Uh, I, I think that's also happening in Singapore. When I was there in the late 80s and 90s, it no one, your, your grandmother stayed in your home. I think more and more there's, there's skilled nursing facilities. But there's going to be some novel organisms evolved due to environmental stresses, which then adapt to humans. I suspect, I'm projecting, you can quote me on that. But may not, it may not be in my lifetime. But, and I think there may be some vectors that adapt as the stress on the environment changes, as the climate warms changes. I think uh, those are going to be the big thing. I think, you know, in, in 20 years, you're a married man, but you've seen the social conventions change to a certain degree. And I think the interaction people have in a more casual fashion increased risk of transmission of <laughs> avenues. I, I hope to be able to continue to enjoy to participate even in a peripheral manner in infectious disease in Singapore. It's a it's an extraordinary opportunity to see it have come as far as it has. There's incredible people there uh, who have surpassed me by logarithms, yourself particularly, who are practicing infectious disease. You got to butter up the interviewer. <laughs> So they give you a good review. And, and uh, so I hope to continue to do that in some form or fashion, even if it's from afar. I, I, I so much enjoy the relationships I've, I've had the good fortune to develop and have learned an enormous amount. I grew up in West Texas. I learned a little bit about North America and, and, and a bit about Europe. I learned nothing about Asia, even though I grew up during some of the, uh, or was the child during some of the conflicts in Asia. So, having had the opportunity, which is, it has been extraordinary, and I hope you continue to learn.